welcome everyone. So now we will do the first three papers of the six and that will be done by Martin and then I will switch back and I will do, uh, I will do the, uh, the, the other three. So Martin, please. Um, thank you, Jan. Yes, so the um, first paper presents a planned update uh, to an electronic archive. The 20,000 pages strong Ludwig Wittgenstein's Nachlass at the University of Bergen is um, in need of an upgrade. The user interface offers three different views on the Nachlass, the source showing the scanned pages, an interactive dynamic presentation where insertions, deletions can be hidden, and a semantic faceted search and browsing where the data can be searched according to annotations, which were added um, during the creation of the Nachlass. Um, for example, consistent dating, the reference persons, etc. Each view has its own search engine where Witfind needs to be mentioned especially. The engine resides in Munich and operates on a copy of the Bergen data. It offers advanced search options like base form search, which the original engine does not provide. Results are shown partly rendered in Munich and partly linked back to Norway. Witfind now enhances the IDP view, but an integration into the SFB view is also planned. The present TEI XML encoding permits already complex views, um, but more is planned and uh, will be implemented, like improving readability by adding another layer that carefully adapts sentences in certain views so that they are syntactically correct when additions or deletions are selected or deselected. Now I would like to give Alius um, a quick opportunity to um, comment, to add a Thank comment. Thank you, Martin. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Hello to everybody and hello also to my Bergen colleagues. I hope uh, uh, Hemet and Eivin, who will help me with the upgrade, uh, can join us for this session, as also Ines Röhrer from Munich, one of my Witfind colleagues. Uh, thank you for your presentation of uh, my paper and the Wittgenstein Archives work, Martin. Maybe I would like to add a few words about the differences uh, between the tools, the services that you presented. So Wittgenstein Source is the site that is conceived for uh, stable editions. So it's the site that gives you a critical edition in stable format. Uh, then we have the IDP, the Interactive Dynamic Presentation site, as you said, that's more a laboratory where users can can produce their own user-defined editions. And then we have the metadata search engine, semantic faceted search and browsing. And in addition, that wonderful Witfind search engine that does the uh, uh, provide for text string search. Uh, the idea is that we have one data set including facsimiles and text data and text metadata and both embedded and standoff markup, but we give them access to these data through these different channels. And each channel comes with strengths and with their own technicalities. And different users will at different times prefer different access points. Thank you. Thank you, Alius. Um, let's get to the second paper. So the second paper presents an approach to improve reproducibility and language technology by combining existing technologies, Weblicht, Docker, and Nix. Weblicht is a well-known workflow manager and provided the tools and data and provided that the tools and data uh, does not change, the workflow will produce the same result a week or a year later. The problem obviously is tools do change and data as well sometimes. Docker is a container technology that can create self-contained tools which follow a recipe, but the recipe is still too vague. And Nix in turn is a package manager which works on hashes and can ensure that defined downloaded, uh, a defined downloaded source reliably, re reliably recreates a binary using defined options and defined compilers. Weblicht does not yet offer versioning of its tools, but the approach presented lays the groundwork for such an addition. 
And now I would like to invite Daniel uh, and Nele to uh, comment. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's a very good summary of our abstract. Um, I would like to add, <clears throat> give a bit more of a bird's eye view and say that um, the integration in Weblicht is uh, for us sort of a case study. So we were interested in the question, is it possible to make a scientific tool fully reproducible? And I think this is an issue uh, that we've probably all encountered that we read a paper, uh, we want to reproduce the results so we want to use the tools that were presented in the paper. And I think as a field, we have improved a lot already and that we make the source code available often and the data available. However, it's often the case that once you have the source code, you spend two or three days figuring out how all the pieces fit together. And uh, I think this is an important part of reproducibility as well. You don't just you know, throw the source code over the wall, but also uh, provide a way for others to reuse it in the same way as you were using it and also to make it easy uh, to make extensions. And yeah, by trying this in Weblicht, we sort of tried the whole chain going from basic models and software to a surface that is fully reproducible. Thanks, Daniel. Coming to the third paper, um, the language archive in Nijmegen has created an impressive software called LUT, which unfortunately cannot be maintained in its present form anymore. The third paper presents experiences with a so, sort of rewrite re of LUT using existing repository solutions like Fedora Commons and Islandora. And the experiences were mostly positive. Users are pleased with the ease of use of the browser and the ingest. Admins appreciate the modular approach that makes it possible to replace stock modules by custom solutions. And it turned out that this was also needed. Nested objects with a large number of children were slow to display and assigning or reassigning permissions was slow and unreliable, requiring custom modules. An update to a newer uh, Fedora Island Islandora version is planned. As a conclusion, I would say such a radical change is possible without harming user satisfaction, but for best results, local modifications are needed. And uh, please, Paul, um, a comment from your side as well. Yeah, thanks, Martin. I think uh, that sums it up quite nicely. Uh, so overall, we've been very pleased for the past uh, two and a half years with the performance uh, of the system and also the stability. Uh, we did encounter some issues, uh, so uh, mostly performance issues in some, some corner cases, uh, like the one with the, the many children of one object, which we were able to, to solve. There are still basically two remaining issues that, uh, that we're still uh, struggling with, which uh, is mainly the, the, uh, the slowness when, uh, when changing uh, access policies. Um, and also there is still an issue with uh, the OEI PMH harvesting that uh, causes errors uh, once in a while. And uh, well, it may be that we have to live with those remaining issues until we uh, migrate to the newer versions of this uh, of this platform, uh, which will have to happen before uh, November uh, 2022, when uh, Drupal 7 becomes end of life. Thanks, Paul. And uh, now I'd like to highlight a few things that I found interesting uh, and worth mentioning in these um, papers just presented. I have not come across a search engine that is separated from its repository by 1,500 kilometers. Both Bergen and the TLR used existing software that they modified, TLA being Nijmegen, sorry for the acronym. Uh, and the not invented here approach or problem pro hopefully goes slowly away. Bergen shows an interesting implementation of the open data approach. WitFind would not be possible without it, and it provides the computer science department in Munich with the opportunity to offer students and uh, master and PhD projects that can have a concrete impact um, to the scientific community. The paper on reproducibility is relevant, in my view, also for Bergen and Nijmegen, and Finklerin for that matter, where I am from. A more controlled development of scientific tools themselves is important. The approach from Tübingen enables not only better tracking of tools and data for scientific experiments, 
but also better tracking of changes to scientific tools like FLAT or the Wittgenstein archives. At least this is what I assume. We get, we get back to that issue in the questions section. But now I'd like to hand over back to Jan uh, to present the second set of papers. Okay, so now we are coming uh, to, the, uh, to the next uh, three papers for this uh, session. Uh, so I will start with the paper uh, actually by six authors, but the Javier de la Rosa was the first one, uh, Poetry Lab as an Infrastructure for the Analysis of Spanish Poetry. So the system they describe in the paper is called Poetry Lab, and it's the environment for annotation or enrichment of Spanish poetry uh, corpora, and uh, the output or the or the thing that should be available to the people who work with it uh, as well is uh, focused on ontologies and linked open data. Uh, it, it, it should be open and uh, there is a architecture behind the system uh, when there is the usual backend and through an API it can be accessed from the user uh, interface. Uh, the, there, are, there are at least three parts if I understand correctly. Uh, these are related to poetry um, analysis. Uh, don't ask me what it, what it means, but hopefully the authors will comment on these uh, three points. Um, and this uh, should be available to anyone who wants to work um, with, uh, with, with the corpus. So that's, uh, that's my very short summary. I would like to ask Javier or any of the authors if you, if you can uh, uh, say a little bit more about this. Sure, uh, thank you Jan for a nice summary of the paper. Um, of course it will be available uh, during the poster session to dig deeper into what scansion, rhyme detection, and judgment and all those uh, kind of weird words uh, mean. Uh, there are uh, only uh, three aspects that I would like to highlight. Um, that is that we, we try to make uh, research um, more available to, to outsiders. Um, so all we do here at the Poetry Lab is part of a European Research Council funded projects called PostData. Uh, mm -hmm. poetry standardization and linking open data. So we're very focused on linking open data and doing research uh, to enrich uh, the, the environment of poetry analysis. Uh, but at the same time, we're very focused on final users. So we try to make all this research available for final users. That's why we are designing all of these uh, APIs, uh, user interfaces, web-based user interfaces. That's why we try to make uh, the deployment and maintenance and easy as possible. That's why we have uh, Docker images that are auto-created, auto-generated every time we push uh, a uh, new commit into a Git repository. Everything is automated, even the release of the libraries in the corresponding uh, Python uh, package index. And there is one more aspect that I would like to commend, and that is the, the availability of corpora and data sets. Um, it's very rare to find openly available data sets for working with poetry. So that's one big part of, of of the API that we are providing now. So you can have access to uh, at least five different languages related corpora for working with, with poetry. And there are no standards yet. So that's why we are applying our own ontology, which we have, have been developing during the, the last five years to provide the metadata necessary to work with these uh, poetry repertories. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Javier. So let's, uh, and, and there will be again uh, some questions at the end as, as Martin will have uh, for the first three papers. So now, now to the fifth paper, and that's Martin Janssen, integrating Taytalk and Context at the, at the Lindat uh, um, repository and, and services. So the, uh, at, at Lindat, there are two, uh, in fact, two different uh, search engines. Context, uh, which is written with K, is, is the standard uh, quick uh, type of tool for searching language corpora, and it can uh, it can display uh, various uh, annotations available. It is uh, it has a back end and a front end, and it's running for many many years. It's used also by the Czech National Corpus, and Taytalk is uh, Martin's uh, search engine, which can work with uh, TI. Uh, 
and almost uh, directly, or at least with a subset of DEI, uh, has its own uh, uh, backend as well. And uh, the question is now uh, what these two different search engines can offer to researchers from various disciplines and uh, whether it is possible to combine uh, them in some way or link them together. So this is, uh, this is the main topic of the paper and I would like to ask Martin to uh, comment on this or add something to this uh, very short summary. Um, it's, it's probably, especially in the light of Clarion, good to point out that uh, uh, Tato has a search engine, but it's actually more of a uh, editing and visualization tool for uh, TEI XML uh, based um, uh, linguistically annotated data. Um, so it, it can do a, a whole range of different visualizations, uh, uh, fo focusing either on facsimile or on audio files. Uh, and it has a very uh, safe, user-friendly, uh, non, uh, not particularly linguistically oriented uh, interface um, that makes it possible to combine linguistic analysis with a much more uh, a human uh, 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 um, uh, humanities kind of uh, approach. Uh, so it's, it's um, very popular amongst uh, uh, projects that uh, are more from the humanities and uh, the work with text, but not necessarily uh, from a linguistic point of, point of view, for instance, uh, just treat them as, uh, as um, historical data to, to do named entity recognition on, uh, on historical documents. And um, um, once it's actually used in, in a specific field, it tends to be very popular amongst uh, uh, those that are not from the linguistic, uh, at least not from computational linguistics, um, so uh, I think by now the majority of historical um, uh, Spanish texts are using data uh, for their interface, just because it's so uh, user friendly to use. Okay, Good. thank it's you, Mark. Linguistic analysis to, uh, to a period. Okay, I, I will have some some additional questions then after after this, and of course you can then uh, talk more to people in the in the breakout sessions. So the last uh, uh, summary uh, we have today is uh, for Bart uh, uh the for the Clarin from the Clarin uh, Denmark, and uh, he his his paper is about so-called text consortium. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also a workflow, workflow management system. Well, that's what this session is about, of course. Uh, it is a remake of an older system. Um, the, uh, but one of the distingu distinguished features is that it sort of automatically assembles the workflows based on a description from the user, um, which, uh, which says what the user actually wants to do uh, sort of end to end. Um, the, um, there is some uh, interaction, of course, where uh, the workflows are suggested that the user can actually select which one uh, they they want to do. Uh, I understood that this uh, should be again integrated into the uh, Clarin Denmark uh, tools, uh, but I'm sure that Bart will uh, have more precise things to say now. Yeah. Um... Yes, uh, uh, in the first place, it, it, the name is the text tonsorium, not the text tonsortium. Uh, that's a, so a, a tonsorium oh. is, is, a, is a kind of barbershop. So you, you enter as a, as, a, as a client and uh, tell the, 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 the barbershop keeper what, to, what, what, what the end result should be and uh, you, you go out of the door with the end result. So that was the idea with the name. Um, yeah, I could add um, something about the user experience, which um, was one of the topics of the paper. Um, so, in, I, uh, on face value, this uh, this web application is is a killer app, but it isn't for a user because it can be difficult to uh, specify the goal. Uh, there are several fields that uh, with big lists, and um, it is not always a good idea to to check values in all of the, all of those pick lists because then you get no workflows in many cases and the, on, the, on the other hand if you if you fill out only one one field uh, for example for type of content uh, then you might might get hundreds of uh, of workflows that you have to choose to choose to choose between uh, so we have to create a guidance for the users um, uh, telling them a tactic, how to a strategy, how to how to work with the, with the text consortium, how to which fields it is a good idea to to select to begin with, and uh, which ones to add if if you get too many workflows or to 
of or or which which ones to to remove if you get no workflows. Um, and then the, the, the so this this uh, selection of fields is is one problem. The other problem that we have to solve by means of of help texts is uh, is an explanation of all the values in each of these uh, dimensions. Uh, many of the values are unique to the text tensorium. And um, so they, we have no equivalence in the, in the, in the clearing concept registry, for example. So there's, some, there's a lot of work to, to be done there. Uh, that's what I wanted to add. Sure. So thank you, Bart. And I think uh, this, is, uh, this is all for the short introductions to the six papers. And now I believe Martin has some specific questions to the first three papers. So please, Martin, uh, now. It's Thank you. Um, yes. So correct me if I'm wrong. I think we agreed on uh, two minutes per answer about. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So in my remarks, I assumed that the approach presented by Danielle and Nele would be relevant also to Alois and Paul. And now I would like to check my assumption and would like to ask Alois and Paul, do you see a need in Tübing's approach? as in stricter versioning of dependencies for the development of your respective services, even if you might not want to use Docker or Nix. Um, Alois? Uh, I think when it comes to the Wittgenstein archives, uh, the change that is most relevant occurs in the data. So uh, our data do change. And then we have these four different channel services and uh, they are independent of each other technically seen. So they share the data, but do not share the infrastructure. Uh, whenever there has been a problem of synchronization there, we have dealt with it uh, manually. Mm -hmm. So ad hoc, uh, uh, but of course, when it comes to the synchronization of the data, then I see uh, uh, a big need there, like for example, when it comes to to uh, uh, synchronizing uh, the with find data with our newest updated XML. Uh, yeah. But that's maybe more belonging to the last question, uh, to, to 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 the third question. Uh, mm. So I I do not a, see a strong need right now. In in a stricter versioning of of uh, of the dependencies when it comes to the tools. Thank you. And Paul, what's your take? Yeah. Also, in our case, uh, the, the the data and the metadata themselves do not change with changes in the, in the repository system. Um, so, in that sense, I agree. Um, but also, yeah, it, it, I mean, it could be, of course, that, that for example, uh, metadata search changes depending on, on how it's implemented and how you index your metadata. Uh, so if that's important for reproducibility, you could argue that, that those kinds of changes uh, should be tracked. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think it's practically possible to have uh, multiple instances of a repository system running uh, for a long period of time, um, and, and also these these systems also uh, get security updates. So it's not just functional changes, but also uh, changes to the uh, it's it's a it's a, web, a system that's open to the world on the web. So they, they implement security patches once and again. And uh, yeah, you do not want to keep old versions that are unpatched running. So I think it's practically uh, not really possible to to do this. Thank you. Um... Coming to the next question, to, da to Danielle and Nela, I would like to pose the question, do you see the obstacles in reproducibility more on the technical side or more on the side of being a desirable goal? Um, I hope the yeah, the question is clear. I hope it's okay if I answer both of them. Yeah. Um, so from the technical side, uh, I mean, we have already heard some problems, but I, I think um, one of the problems is that a lot of, sort of ecosystems that we use are not really built around reproducibility. So let me give one example. Um, so a colleague of mine uh, was training models and uh, then suddenly um, the performance of his baseline model went down significantly. 
and he spent a week uh, figuring out what happened. So he brought his code back to the old versions, he ensured that the data was um, at the right versions, et cetera, but it systematically got low performance. And it turned out, so he was using the, the Hugging Face Transformers library for uh, using uh, the German BERT model. And it turned out that uh, the, the people who made the German BERT model had replaced the vocabulary file and um, word piece, uh, sorry, uh, Hugging Face tokenizers automatically downloaded the new vocabulary. Yeah. So, and I, I think this happens a lot in a lot of packaging ecosystems that there's the convenience of automatically downloading stuff but then all the versioning also goes out of the window and uh, reproducibility. Uh, I think another technical issue is that um, it is possible to version data, but I think for real reproducibility, it would also be nice if we could make the part reproducible where we go from data to say models, uh, but practically that's too expensive, right? Because some models, they take days to train. And uh, yeah, make it reproducible as possible, but not very practical. So uh, we sort of worked around that now by just providing the models as data, but I, I think that's sub-optimal. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I think um, with the, the non-technical part, I, I think most people probably agree that it's a desirable goal, right? If we do science, we should also make it possible um, to, for others to reproduce our results. I think the problem is more that it takes a lot of work to do that you hit a lot of bumps and um, there are only very few approaches currently that provide full reproducibility, but um, yeah, they're kind of hard to use. So I think there, uh, we still need to explore the space of what techniques can be used there and also to um, sort of educate or train people in using these techniques um, so that they can adjust their current workflows um, more towards reproducibility. Thanks. Yeah, fully agree. Um, and as a final question to Alois and Paul, do you support versioning? And if you don't, how important do you think this feature is? Let's start with Alois again. Uh, we have just begun to support versioning. And I think it's very important. Let me just give you two cases from the IDP, the interactive dynamic presentation world. Now, if you, let's say today, do a, a stylometric study on the basis of the transcriptions of all Wittgenstein Atlas typescripts that you download from the IDP site, then in order to, uh, to uh, verify the research result uh, in five years or only five weeks, you would have needed to version the data you would have needed to version the tool, the actual IDP tool, and you would also have needed to version your, your setup for choosing among the different options. So we would need to version three things, data tool and the user specific user defined set, setup, because you can in the IDP setup choose uh, to get the text with or without the handwritten editions, with or without the deleted parts and so on. And depending on what you pick, you will get a different text. And in order to, to being able to reproduce your research result, you would then afterwards have to have a line that records all these, these options that you picked. And uh, a second example would be would be citation if you cite from the Nachlass on the basis of our transcription. You will again have run through a process of picking this or that option. And ideally one should have a record of all those parameters that you in the end chose in order to, to, to being able to reproduce the precisely same citation. So I do see this need both for uh, stability of citation and verif verifiability of research results and other other cases. I could add something, but I think I've used my two minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Paul, what's your take? Yeah, and I'm sorry the two minutes, well, I guess for both, but anyway, it's an interesting discussion. So. Yes, we, we do support versioning. It's, it's important for our uh, type of collections because they often uh, are from, from depositors that work on these collections throughout their career. So uh, speci especially uh, with regards to annotation and transcriptions, they get new insights in the language and, and might revise them um, from time to time. So it's, 
it's very important for, for reproducibility uh, to support versioning of these of these collections. Um, of course, if you don't uh, support versioning of your uh, support updates of your collection, you have static uh, collections that never change, and that that's also a model. But but that doesn't work for us. We we need to support these kind of dynamic collections, and, and then yeah, <clears throat> it's important to support uh, strict versioning. Thanks very much, and. This concludes actually my uh, set of questions and I would like to hand over back to Jan. Okay, so I also have uh, uh, questions, uh, one question to, to each of the papers I presented. So for Javier, um, uh, and I think I am now also stealing someone's question from the chat. Uh, there was a question whether it can be applied to non-Spanish languages. So Javier, if you can, uh, if you can answer. Um, it would be easy to adapt to other Romance languages like Italian with a little bit of before, but right now it's not properly designed to handle other languages than Spanish. Uh, that being said, uh, the analysis of poetry is very idiosyncratic and depends a lot of the traditions of each uh, language. So even though they tend to share the same kind of a structure when you are doing a, an scansion of a poem, for example, which is basically counting out how many syllables are a stress or if, if, if it's food base, uh, what, are, what are the stresses in a line of affairs, they all follow the same kind of modules in the analysis. First, you syllabify each word, then you try to find the stress of the words, and then you try to find the pattern in, in the line. Uh, with that said, uh, we don't have support right now for other languages, but we are working on a multilingual approach that employs uh, language modeling to try to tackle the problem of multilingual scansion in, in, in poetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Javier. Uh, so they'll also uh, res respond some of the questions in the in the chat. So now, Martin, uh, um, the um, uh, I know we have discussed it, but I would like to take it uh, public. Uh, the the backends to various search engines have various uh, properties, and uh, some of them can handle really big uh, uh, texts like. Uh, the, the context uh, backend can, uh, but uh, the corpus workbench uh, probably cannot uh, handle such big uh, corpora. So how you, uh, do you see there's a problem or uh, can you somehow see how uh, the backends can cooperate? And I think again, in the chat, we had a question whether we can combine various backends with various frontends. So your take, but please uh, uh, very short since we only have five, six more minutes for everything. <laughs> Um, let me answer in two, two parts. Uh, yes, uh, the corpus frequency, uh, this present, current version has a 2.14 billion word uh, limit, uh, which is simply because they store uh, the, the numbers in a four byte uh, uh, field. So, um, uh, given what, what TEDOC does, that TEDOC actually uh, stores a lot of information about the corpus. Uh, I, the biggest corpus that we have in, in TEDOC is my own uh, multilingual uh, newspaper corpus, which has 500 million words or something. Uh, and, and with everything that it stores, that becomes uh, a corpus of like uh, 200 gigabytes or so. So for corporate dead large, uh, uh, an approach like this that stores that much information really becomes sort of uh, cumbersome. So there really isn't that much need, I think, to, to use a system like that to, for, for uh, the really, really huge corpora, uh, because storage simply really becomes a problem in those kind of cases. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, the, the, the relation between TITOC and, and uh, the corpus workbench is, is very light. It just uses it as a convenient uh, search interface for a bunch of things. And the relation between context and uh, TITOC has nothing to do with the, the corpus workbench. It directly uh, points to corpus positions, but it can also do it by, uh, by token ID and by, by text ID, uh, which has absolutely no limits. Uh, so you can relate them uh, together. The only problem would be to uh, uh, to get the data from the XML into uh, uh, a context because it currently actually does that via CVV. So it, you sort of get a, 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 a inherited, but easy to avoid uh, reliance on the corpus workbench. Okay. Okay. Thanks, uh, Martin. So last question for Bart. Um, you, I think you mentioned uh, either in the uh, in the paper that uh, there could be other other third party tools integrated. Now, how how difficult this is? Because you know maybe many there are many uh, workflow managers or even frameworks which say okay you just put a Docker in, but but in many cases this is not so trivial. So 
your your take on this? Well, the yeah, the the text consortium produces a PHP file uh, for for a, a wrapper for for each tool. Um, so you you can you can integrate any any tool that that can be run on the command line because it is very very easy to to activate command line tools from PHP. Uh, so it's that's no problem at all technically. Uh, the real problem, the bigger problem, which 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 uh, software people like me uh, easily forget, is to also. Uh, Take care of the of the of the documentation, uh, and that's only that that's that's something that we that we have started uh, very late. So that's I think that's the harder part of of any integration of any tool, not only third party uh, tools. Okay, thank you, Bert. Um, so uh, I. Um, so we also have uh, general questions, uh, but we have two of them. So maybe since we only have uh, like three or four minutes, uh, we will just start with the first one and we'll see how it goes. Uh, this is th These are questions to all six papers. So uh, if you do not want to answer, it's fine. If anyone wants to answer, please raise your hand either in the in the um, um, in the chat or uh, above the chat in the in the uh, a participants list or just raise your hand in, in the video. Um, so um, the first question is that if we talk about workflows, which is the topic of this part, um, sometimes we uh, we get a zero possibility how to assemble the workflow because simply there is a small bit missing. I mean, we have a tool which can produce TEI, another tool which can take TEI, but there are there is you know something which the next tool cannot handle, and we would need just a small you know conduit or wrapper or conversion tool. Um, how do you see this happen, or can it uh, at all happen? Can the workflow uh, manager suggests that, okay, yeah, I don't have it, but if someone writes this for you, uh, you can have it. So any of you. Bart yes, wanted Bart. to answer. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, uh, the big caps cannot be done uh, automatically, but, there are, but you know, the um, data is described at two levels. The, and the main level, uh, the, um, is 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 uh, made visible to the user. The second level is mostly kept hidden for the user, and it can describe things like different text sets. So you have uh, uh, a sub specification for the same type of content, for example, of of two, or, and you could tell that. The, the text consortium, it is not currently the case. I find it a very uh, uh, good idea. Uh, you could tell the text consortium, consortium to disregard all subspecifications and then see whether the, the, the text consortium computes a workflow. Mm -hmm. And then the, the text consortium could infer that and, and tell the user, well, if you if you uh, write a tool that translates from text at A to text at B and integrate it in the in the text consortium, then indeed you would have a workflow. Okay, so uh, maybe one more answer to this question. Anyone, any, any of the other five uh, uh, presenters? So. Martin. Um, if you disregard uh, the tax set problems, which are very hard to, uh, to overcome because uh, typically uh, many corporates actually adapt existing uh, tax sets as well. So, so it, it becomes very hard to actually uh, do that correctly. But if you just look at the workflow of, of say all major uh, current uh, workflow uh, tools, then the files that they use are very well described. So uh, if you simply combine the different uh, uh, converters that they provide, then, then I think you can almost convert everything into everything else. We, we have a set ourselves and uh, Paula has a set and uh, you have salt and pepper and, and these things together, I think uh, can basically cover all the, the gaps that you could possibly encounter. Okay, thanks for the answer. I, 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 I have to slightly disagree that uh, uh, sometimes, even if it looks like a format problem, it might be a more deeper problem, like uh, that some of the formats cannot handle certain types of graphs. I think we have this problem when we talk to the US uh, standard, uh, the lab script uh, uh, people, then in some cases it, it is hard to convert because for example, the UD format uh, can have two 
uh, to overla overlaid formats, in fact, which looks like it almost like a general graph. And then, then it's much harder to write a simple system to convert to something which cannot even handle that type of structure. So in some cases, it is difficult, but, but otherwise you are right that uh, there are already many converters. It would be nice if these workflows can sort of uh, show them all in a way and, and so that people can actually fill in uh, the gaps. So. Thank you very much. I, I think the second question I don't have to ask now because I have seen several references to things like versioning and, and, uh, and the reproducibility in the chat. So thank you very much.